Widener, if you've never uh, seen it before, this is an image of it uh, from the outside uh, looking in. The back side does not look as good as the front side, hence the picture of the front of Widener. Uh, you may be wondering, Meg, hmm, all these steps doesn't seem that accessible. Folks who have mobility issues uh, going upstairs are able to access Widener from the behind um, off of Mass Avenue on the other side, just to talk a bit about that. And we'll be talking a little bit more about um, accessibility in our findings about this uh, Widener Wayfinding and Service report that we did. Uh, I will reintroduce myself <laughs> for the recording. Um, so my name is Meg McMahon. I use they, them pronouns. I am the user experience researcher here at Harvard Library. Um, I joined in April uh, 2022, so this was one of my very first big projects. I'm very excited to uh, talk about it with you today. You can email, email me at meg underscore mcmahon at harvard.edu, uh, and we will get on with it. The first thing I want to do is I made this presentation a little more interactive. Um, there's a couple of questions. So Amy said, put your questions in the chat, but they'll be addressed later. Just know that I'm going to also be asking you to type in the chat in relation to some questions as we go forward. Uh, so when you think of Widener, if you've been there, if you've seen it, uh, what do you think of it? Um, if you've never been, what feelings do you get from the photo I shared at the beginning? I'm going to give us about a minute and I'm going to talk a bit about um, the responses that we get in the chat. But I just want to, ooh, imposing. <laughs> That's a great one. Big, illustrious. The steps and the columns look like they're keeping us out. The Titanic, formal, uh, historic. And while some of these, ooh, Rabbit Warren Labyrinth. I don't understand Rabbit Warren. Um, and if you can hear a uh, siren in the background of my sound, I'm so sorry. Um, I live on a very busy street uh, here in Boston. Um, I cannot help when that happens. But going back to the comments that we saw here in the chat, uh, all these things can be true. It both can be formal, it can be big and illustrious, uh, and it can also be imposing. It can be uh, frustrating at times. As we can see here from Kai, very confusing to navigate from the inside, even as someone who's worked there for years. Um, and also some folks here on the call who have been inside Widener before and worked there and saying it is a labyrinth even if you work there. Uh, these are all things that we hear about um, in, uh, we heard over the course of us studying Widener a little bit and understanding how people find their way in it and how they find services in Widener. Thank you so much for participating in the chat. Um, and I will move on to just some images about Widener and talking about it. So this is an example of a reading room that's in Widener. Uh, this is um, the Atkins Loker reading room. They're kind of attached. Um, but uh, this is illustrious, right? We heard that word. We can see uh, looking back um, in the image, some tall columns, the ceilings are very high. When you're in this space, you can't help but feel like a sense of uh, you being small, right? And sometimes that's really great for us uh, when it comes to design. Sometimes feeling small can like make you feel awe. You can be like, oh, I'm here in this historic place. Other times uh, when you feel small in a space like this, it can make you feel like you don't belong there. It can make you feel like uh, you are not able to actually understand the space in the way that you would hope you are. Um, so once again, like spaces like this, beautiful and also sometimes scary. Uh, we also have an example of the Widener Memorial Library here. Um, for those who don't know, Widener um, was actually built as a memorial uh, for someone who had passed away. Uh, they said in the Titanic um, and his mother uh, wanted to give his collection to Harvard and then build a space around um, memorializing him. 
Uh, so I just wanted to give an example of this room, what it looks like. You can see at the front the Gutenberg Bible that uh, is a big deal here at Harvard that we have one. Uh, you can see his whole collection around. But also, I want to just take a minute to note some of these signs that might be hard to read. Room alarmed, no photography. You see, uh, you know, blockades blocking you from the rest of the room. It makes you feel like, oh, you can look, but you can't necessarily touch. Um, and this is like a space for select individuals. Um, so once again, can be true, uh, both looking beautiful, looking very idyllic, um, cozy even, uh, and also a place where you don't necessarily belong. Uh, and then I wanted to just give an example of bit about um, how Widener can be used with students. Um, this is CS50 office hours. Uh, this is a um, just an image from that same room that we had seen earlier with the reading room. Uh, and uh, going back, you can see a bunch of people working on their CS50 projects together. And then I wanted to take a special moment um, to uh, recognize the stacks in Widener. Uh, so this is a small video of the basement of Widener, the very low, last level, level D. Uh, and I wanted to just show for someone who's never actually been in the basement of Widener, which once again are places where people are pointed to to find books um, still in the building, uh, what it feels like and what it, the experience is like. I did not take this video. This is a video I found on YouTube, um, but I can say I have been in the basement of Widener and uh, the feelings you get while watching this video um, I have had those feelings. <laughs> so as you can see, you're walking along, there's some lights. Oh no, you turn into a space where the lights aren't turning on, you're still walking. Um, oh, but the lights, not by me, farther by the door just turned on. Oh, kind of weird. Um, you turn and it takes a second for the lights to turn on again. Um, so just uh, something to note, we reference a comment that a student makes later in the conversation um, about Widener and being in the stacks, but it is kind of scary, um, especially with how the lights work um, and how close quarters uh, books are and the shelving, which are, uh, I found out in a um, tour of Widener are structural to the building, like these need to be there for the building to be up and like stand straight. Uh, so the stacks have to stay where they are, just if anyone's curious about that. Um, and then I wanted to point to another thing, um, just user confusion. I did a little bit of research online uh, prior to this uh, conversation to see if anyone had talked about Widener as um, in, in any context. And I found this really interesting uh, thread, which is linked at the bottom of my slides, where Yvette uh, talks about many of the same things we found uh, in our research. She says that there's no Wi-Fi in most of the sections, four stories down. Uh, you can see on the right side here, she is looking for a way out. Even though she can see the map, she is still confused about how she's supposed to exit the stacks. Uh, this is something that, once again, we hear a little bit later uh, in the presentation. All this to say is that I just wanted to give us a little bit of context about Widener before we actually get into the questions we were asking, uh, our process, the findings, and a little bit of the recommendations that we gave um, to the group uh, who asked us to do this research. Because I think that that context building is important in the process of thinking about a research study. So thank you with, for coming on me with that journey uh, through Widener Library, through images, a little bit of video and conversation. So the question, right? What is our biggest thing that we're trying to figure out here? Our project stakeholders that helped us uh, ask this question uh, were Amy Boucher and Lee Lafleur. Um, they work in access services and research, teaching, and learning. Their work makes them um, very closely tied to Widener as a space, uh, both in how you know someone can get a book from circulation to the type of teaching that the library does in this space. Uh, so one of their biggest questions when they came to us was, uh, where are patrons confused in Widener? 
Um, what is their confusion related to? Is it specifically wayfinding, like I can't find the bathroom? Or is it related to services, as in, I would like to find a research librarian to help me with a research question that I have while I'm in the space? Uh, so those are the two big things that we were concerned about uh, in this project and in this study. So I just want to shout out the project team here because it wasn't just me working on this. Amy also worked on this project. Uh, Lee LaFleur and Ramona Crawford and uh, Annika Gidley, all of them made contributions to this project in various different ways. Um, and you will see that as we talk about the process going forward and where they had their hands uh, in this project. So let's talk about the process. Uh, how did we actually kind of answer that question? Where are people getting confused? Uh, and what are they looking for actually? Is it like a specific known space or is it a service within the space? Um, so from those questions, our research goals came to uh, understand why people are coming into Widener in order to connect them with appropriate services and support, understand where people get confused in Widener and if they're able to get help. This could be related to wayfinding services or finding items. And then finally learn where there are opportunities to improve the content and location of signage in Weiner. Once again, related to either just where's a bathroom to how do I find a research librarian to talk to in this space. And then once again, I said I made this a little interactive. Um, if you know a bit about UX research, which method would you use given the research goals and the context of this study so far? Would you be into doing a survey? Would you want to do interviews? Would you like to do the fun um, observation tactic where you just kind of stay in a corner and watch people walk around the space? Um, I'm curious to hear what types of methods folks would be interested in using for something like this. And you can use it in the chat, um, by the way. <laughs> okay, I see your observation. which is a great one, by the way. Um, survey, interviews as well. Station people in various parts of the library and ask people what they're looking for. Interviews, stopping people who look confused and asking questions. Uh, these are all great ways to get at the question, right? Uh, Hidden cameras, <laughs> whoa, not really, obviously, but it would be fascinating. Uh, I agree, it would be fascinating, <laughs> but also the hair on the back of my neck stood up <laughs> when I saw that one in the chat. Uh, but yeah, you could learn a lot from a hidden camera in Winder, I believe. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for humoring me and putting in your own ideas for this. Um, so what we did specifically is we did exit surveys with uh, Widener visitors. We did intercept interviews with Widener visitors and interviews with the main desk security guards. So some of you folks guessed what we were doing, um, doing some surveys, some interviews as well. Uh, and I will go into each three of these and how they worked a little bit more in detail uh, right now. So let's talk about um, the exit survey focus. Like what were we really trying to get out of that exit survey? Uh, so we were interested in users and if they struggled to complete anything they came to do. So find their way, find an item, get help from a person, right? The importance and difficulty of finding locations in Widener, like the bathrooms, stacks, a place to eat or drink. And then we wanted to also create a space where if users had uh, an opportunity to give suggestions for improvement to the space or ways that they could maybe think about uh, Widener as a space that they could move through easier. Uh, for that, we get a lot of signs, <laughs> right? That's what a lot of people write. But we did get some really great suggestions um, from folks while having this like open uh, prompt. A little bit more, so that's what we were trying to figure out, right? And I wanted to just talk a little bit about the specifics. So for the tools for this, we used Qualtrics um, and a QR generator. Uh, so the survey was actually tucked inside uh, books that people were picking up 
from Widener Library. So as you can see, our participants were the users picking up the books from Widener. That's just a small subset of the population that uses Widener. Not everyone who goes into Widener picks up a book, but we thought that uh, it could be a great way to get a large group of people's um, ideas and uh, thoughts and feelings and behaviors um, and attitudes about Widener from this population. The time commitment of the exit survey was no more than 10 minutes. And there was a compensation. So if you participated in the survey, uh, you could be entered in a raffle to get a $30 gift card. And specifically just to touch on the analysis a little bit, um, for the survey, we did data visualizations and affinity diagramming of the open questions. Uh, so we were able to see similarities you know, from the visualizations and then also from the affinity diagramming that we did. For the intercept interview, uh, we were interested in why users were in that space. If they had troubles finding uh, a service or a space, if they wanted research help in Widener, and their suggestions, once again, in creating a more navigable Widener. For the Intercept interview for this focus, what we did is we were in the space, and some of you had guessed that too in the chat. We were in the space and uh, we looked around and we were curious about what folks looked confused, if there were folks who maybe would be interested in talking with us. Uh, we did get a lot of, um, no, I'm too busy right now, uh, but that's okay, it happens. Uh, but we were able to get quite a few participants to talk to us about um, how they were experiencing Widener in real time and also how they historically had uh, experienced Widener. Um, so we did this in uh, three locations, um, the circulation desk, the second floor landing outside of Atkins and Loker, and then outside the front door. What we found is that the second floor landing outside of Atkins and Loker was probably the best space for this type of interview, uh, because if folks were around the circulation desk or the front door, they were like in a moment of like movement a little bit more than we found folks on the outside of Atkins and Loker. Usually people were kind of hanging hanging out or looking for an excuse to stop studying outside the second floor landing of Atkins and Loker. So we were able to get a lot more folks to talk to us there. If you ever do a study in Widener or a space like it, highly suggest some type of lobby space where people are milling a little bit to do these interviews. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit about how we did this. We took paper notes uh, in the process with folks and we used um, Google Forms to easily bring it online where we were able to sort online together through the themes that we were seeing. I also wanted to shout out Ramona, Lee, and Amy for their moderation uh, during this process. All of them helped me with the data collection uh, in the Intercept interviews. And then once again, just to be a little bit specific for folks, um, our tools that we used for this was that Google Forms and pen and paper. Um, our participants were users of Widener. Uh, the time commitment was no more than 10 minutes. I believe for me, my longest interview was 10 minutes and it was with an older gentleman who had been here for a very long time since the 70s. And he was just talking to me about how much he loved Widener. The compensation for folks that they wanted was a Harvard umbrella. Um, a lot of people loved umbrellas. It was a great compensation for this. And for our analysis, we used affinity diagramming as a group together to find the themes. And then we also did uh, a security guard uh, interview focus, right? We wanted to ask the folks who are in the space every day, what are the things that they're seeing and what are the themes they're finding in how people talk to them? Uh, and we were curious about how often they help people navigate the space and any interventions that they think could be helpful for users of the space. Because once again, they're the folks who are usually the first point of contact for most users in Winer because you have to go through a gate where you see a security guard before you move on to the rest of the space. Um, just some things that, about this, we used Zoom for this. Um, we only had one participant. We tried to have more than one security guard participant, but it was hard because of scheduling and some other things. But we did have one interview. The time commitment was no more than 30 minutes for this individual. And for our analysis, we did thematic coding throughout the interview to see themes across the interview uh, itself. So in total uh, participants, we had 79 for the exit survey, 54 for the intercept interviews and one security guard interviews. So that's over 130 people who have participated in this um, process with us to talk about Widener. And that's a really good number for 
uh, the type of insights and recommendations we found. So for data analysis, um, I just wanted to touch here. Uh, the first thing I did was do um, an affinity diagramming session with Lee and Ramona for the intercept interviews. And then after seeing the themes for those, I synthesized both the survey and the security guard interview using that session with more than one person as a touchstone. Uh, because I knew that for me, if I uh, did it all myself, right, I, there could be biases that I couldn't see. And by using the affinity diagram session, um, I was able to help mitigate the bias in the process of looking at research as one individual going forward. So let's talk about the insights. I talked to you about how we did it. Uh, let's get into what we actually found, which is very interesting. Um, so some space insights. We found that the majority of participants use Widener uh, to pick up or research. Oh, so, whoa, I read that way wrong. <laughs> to study or research, to pick up a book, to browse the stacks, or to view items that are in library use only. Uh, and most of these were uh, a combination, right? So a lot of the folks um, were doing multiples of these things in Widener um, during their time using the space. I will say that um, study and research was very, very high. Most of the folks we talked to in the Intercept interviews and also folks who um, were picking up a book really seemed to like to study or research in Widener as a space um, for them on campus. Uh, I believe pick up a book so high is probably because of our survey, um, but that was something that we also had heard um, during our Intercept interviews. So we believe it was important to put here as well. Another thing uh, that we found is the most important locations in Widener for participants. Um, so some of these are circulation desk, bathrooms, stacks, the study carrels, the location of library staff, and reading rooms. Now I'll say something I found interesting in this uh, insight is that the stacks and study carrels are technically in the same space. Um, the study carrels are in the stacks, uh, but because of the user's um, like association with those uh, items separately, they decided that they were two separate locations or the folks said that that's where they were going opposed to going to the stacks if they were going to a study carol. Though, if you've been in winery, you know it's exactly the same space. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting here too is that you see circulation desk and you also see location of library staff as being the most important locations in Widener and you would think those are the same as well. And something that we found uh, during our analysis is that uh, at the circulation desk folks are really interested in people who are um, working in Widener who have like a deep knowledge of the space or a deep knowledge of the library collections. And a lot of the front um, facing folks at the circulation desk are students um, or employees of like that nature. Uh, so in the conversations, the location of the library staff was like very specifically folks were interested in um, library staff who were like deeply knowledgeable about the space and they could easily ask questions um, or get research help in that way where maybe a student worker wouldn't be able to help in that exact same way for them. Here's another question break. Um, so we in the next on the next slide we're going to be talking about the most difficult spaces to find in Widener. Um, what do you think those spaces might be if you've been in the space? What do you think is difficult to find? Ooh, the Judica division. I hope I said that right. Yeah, the Judaica division. Thank you, um, the Judaica division. Yeah. There's even a special elevator. Oh, to get to it. Mm -hmm. Exits, meeting rooms, the correct elevator bathrooms. Um, I will say to on the point of exits, I had a really interesting interview uh, with someone where I guess after Widener closes to the general public and then like people are able to mill out, um, they can only leave from the Mass Ave exit. And folks who the who come in through the um, the steps that we saw at the beginning, right, opposed to the back exit, they are so confused about how to actually leave the building after like the hours are done. Um, so that was something that uh, was noted by one participant, um, but I thought was interesting. And I and Phil, when you wrote exits, 
it really um, sparked that in my mind. Um, but I would say some of you are like really correct. So <laughs> the most difficult locations to find are a place to eat or drink, bathrooms, um, location of classrooms or meeting rooms, um, and then the location of the elevators. Uh, something to note in this uh, list as well, a lot of these things, um, aside from necessarily the location of the meeting room or classroom, are actually like really big accessibility concerns um, for folks. Uh, if some folks actually need to eat or drink during the day um, because of certain things that they might have going on uh, with their bodies, um, as well as bathrooms and elevators. So I think that uh, seeing those three in this group for me really points to more accessibility information about Widener um, and being sure that like folks who need to find these spaces that they need for um, them to like uh, move about the space in the way that makes the most sense to them and the ways that they need uh, should be pointed to more um, in our like maps and uh, online even about Widener. And we talk about that a little bit in the recommendations, but that's something I wanted to point out here specifically, because I think it's something that's really interesting um, about this specific insight. Um, and then I wanted to do a special shout out to the stacks. <laughs> um, we have this quote here from an undergraduate student uh, who said that they nearly had a panic attack um, in the stacks uh, because they were unable to like figure out how they actually leave um, from the middle of it. Uh, so just thinking back to that video I played um, at the very beginning, if you've never been in the stacks, it is extremely disorienting. Um, so one of our findings then based on that uh, and based on many people's experience of the stacks is that navigating the stacks is particularly difficult. And multiple participants said that the exiting the stacks and the basement of the stacks are particularly confusing. If you remember um, from that Twitter uh, image that I had, you can see too that uh, even looking at a map is confusing uh, in this basement of the stacks uh, for most folks. And I would say that that was uh, actually pretty um, seen throughout our conversations with folks and the things that we found in this study. Ooh, I see Kay says, I was late to my first meeting with my academic advisor as an undergrad because I couldn't find the way out of D-level stacks. Oh, that sounds <laughs> really real. Um, I, I, For me, I got lost uh, going from the Widener to Lamont um, in the basin of the stacks. And I too uh, was late for something because of my confusion trying to take that route. So I feel you there. Um, another quote that I wanted to pull out um, that helps uh, us understand an insight is, I had trouble discerning which reading rooms are outfitted for laptop use. I discovered the reading room I'm using by wandering around the buildings to test waters. Um, and this was from a PhD candidate. And something that I think is really um, big throughout uh, the study is that users are unsure of the norms of Widener spaces and how to know when a room is available for patron use. Um, participants seem to be really interested in the context of the spaces within Widener. Uh, as an example, one user was interested um, in notices of when a room would be closed, and another in relation to the room closing thought that an empty room was reserved for others to use, even though it was something that they actually could use. So something to think about uh, in this is context building about the actual rooms of Widener could be really helpful for people letting people know where they can easily find power, letting people know where they can easily, um, like uh, have, a, have a space uh, to research, even though it's like completely empty, and, but they can go inside. Um, and another thing about this that I wanted to point to from previous research that I did in a different institution is that actually building the context and having like an online website or space to talk about uh, what people can do in a building helps um, dampen library anxiety. Because if you're able to actually see what you're able to do in this space and like plan how you're gonna use that space before you go, it really helps you um, not only navigate the space, but feel more comfortable in it while you're there. Uh, so something to think about in relation to this like cluster of insights. And then I also wanted to point to research help and service insights. So it can be hard to find a staff member at the circulation desk or elsewhere within Widener. I kind of pointed to that a little bit before. And specifically when they say staff member, they mean someone who can really help them with research. 
um, or really help them find um, like something that they don't believe a, a student worker might be able to help them with. Um, gaining access to Widener as an outside researcher is a confusing process. We had a couple of conversations with outside researchers um, who said, like trying to navigate um, Widener, even like at a distance to get access to it was hard because there was a lot of email pinging around, right? Like they say, oh, you're supposed to talk to this person. And then that person says, oh, you're supposed to talk to this person. So it's a little bit confusing for outside researchers to actually know how to gain access to Widener as a resource. Um, and then the last insight is inconsistent Wi-Fi throughout Widener. Um, to be honest, this might be really hard to fix because it's an old building, but it was something that was noted a lot uh, throughout our conversations. So the recommendations from there. I kind of talked a bit about them as I talked about insights because I really think of them closely related. Uh, but a couple um, things that I want to do first is what recommendations would you give given the insights? What's something that you would uh, change in Widener based on what you've heard so far or what you know about the space as well? And it's okay to think really big too. I wanna, I wanna give people permission to do that. Um, arrows on the floor of the stacks guiding people out. Oh, that's a, that's a really good idea. Mm, someone says same. Exit lights on the floor like an airplane. Ooh, I like that too. Or something that glows in the dark to help um, plaques on meeting room doors to provide more info. That's also a great idea. Better signage, a fact sheet about Weiner, a website where the fact sheet is. Information at the entrance, signage in the front door of every study space, better web guidance. Panic phones. There's actually phones in the stacks uh, for those who maybe don't know, but I think that the signage and the language around them, it's hard to know that you could actually use those phones. <laughs> um, better online info about spaces, 3D projection of floors. These are all great suggestions. Thank you so much. Um, and then library staff more visible and accessible, an app. Um, Students were really into the idea of an app, um, by the way. We did get a lot of suggestions for apps, but we were worried about the feasibility of that in the recommendations. So uh, we have a little bit of working around um, that we did for that. An app would need better Wi-Fi. Thank you, Phil. Also a great point um, for an app's use. Um, even services cut off in the basements of Whitener, by the way. Like you, you are not actually able to even use your phone um, based on your own service plan, uh, at least for me. And I'm on, I believe, AT&T. So some things that we decided were maps <laughs> um, and a couple different ways of getting at maps, right? You could have a physical map of the desk um, of the security guard and the circulation desk to actually point people um, to the places they're interested in. Um, when someone asks them a question, opposed to just trying to explain it without like a physical representation of the space. Um, an online virtual map, either, either using Google Interiors or other methods. This is something um, that's gaining traction right now is Google Interiors for specifically really big spaces where you're able to like zoom in on a building, but actually see like what rooms are within the spaces on Google Maps. Um, and then improving signage within the stacks specifically on how to exit, navigating between east and west stacks, and navigating in and through the basement, um, as well being big things to think about there. And then once again, that context building for patrons that I kind of talked about, um, and I'm really passionate about in um, my own work. Um, signage and or a website explaining a room's purpose activities that are allowed within the space and its unique assets, specifically like outlets, um, if you're able to eat there, because there is a place to eat in Widener, um, and I didn't know about it until I talked to someone who had found it. Um, so those are things that could be really helpful for patrons. Um, and then provide accessibility information for patrons online or in key points throughout the building, um, specifically something that um, was noted multiple times was elevator access directions from the mass ab entrance to the main lobby because folks who are once again in wheelchairs or uh, other methods where it's hard for them to walk up the stairs or other things are happening um, 
there is actually no instruction for them on how to find the main lobby from the Mass Ave entrance. And even finding the elevator is confusing from the basement. Um, or not, I guess not the basement of Weiner, but the space that's like uh, ground level at that point. Um, so another thing to think about uh, with this context building. And then we also thought a bit about future study. Um, Meg, oh yeah. Uh, just about that when you enter Widener on um, you know, the Mass Ave entrance, mm -hmm. that door really bangs shut. And I was thinking about accessibility. Like, what about people in wheelchairs? I guess they hold the door open. Yeah. But I, like that seems like an accessibility issue. It's really, it can hurt people. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised we don't look at that. But I just wanted to bring that up. No, Ramona, that's a great point. And also, I, I do think that, um, I think that's a great point, but I also think that there's a button that you can press that holds it open, holds those doors open as well. Um, I've had someone uh, mm -hmm. press that button for me when I was carrying something into Widener one time. Um, maybe that works. I, yeah, maybe I don't But it's not, it. it's not the best, It you know, but it, it is something that I think folks tried to get at that problem that you're describing um and also the doors if you don't know are pretty thin <laughs> also right the like the actual like net getting through it it's a pretty um narrow door as well something else to think about um and then danielle here says having a person obviously central place who can draw a path to your destination with a physical map oh after hearing through some of the other ideas that's a great idea danielle and then um, Lee saying we have a 3D virtual uh, tour of Widener on this platform. So those are some things that you can see in the chat too, if you're interested. And I believe Amy put in um, an article about how uh, Google Maps can give you directions um, using that Google Interiors idea as well. So some things, if you haven't checked out the chat in a minute, there's some things there. Um, so let's talk about the ideas for future studies, because we did also, we did this research, we have recommendations, but something to know with the UX research process is that it's never necessarily complete. Um, and you can always do more research to help uh, find more answers to these questions. So um, I wanted to have one final question break. Uh, oh, I said, what recommendations? <laughs> I wrote this wrong. I What future studies would you, be interested in given these um, insights is the question I'm interested in, um, opposed to recommendations. Like what future studies could you see being done based on what we've talked about so far today? And once again, it's okay to be really big in these ideas. Whether or not the things you implemented are working, that's also a great point, Dorian, that it's always a process to make sure that the changes we make are actually good changes. Um, incorporating recommendations into find a space on the Harvard Library website, also a great idea, Phil. Um, user testing of different types of signage to see what's most useful and easiest to understand from Kai. Uh, and then Anne, uh, specifically targeting surveying folks with physical challenges. Um, and Shamalar, if I say your name wrong, let me know. Um, doing my best. Uh, how do undergrads, grads, and outside researchers use these spaces specifically in Widener? Um, yeah, these are all great ideas for future research. Uh, and Jeremy, using gate, tout, gate count data um, to understand who is in the library and who isn't coming into the library and then thinking about services to meet those gaps are also a great idea. Because like we something that, um, to know is that the people that we haven't been able to talk to are the ones who weren't in Widener. All of our uh, study like gathering participant methods were uh, central about who was actually in the space. So that's a really great point, Jeremy. And then Rebecca says, uh, doing user testing with people brand new to Harvard or Widener. That's also a great idea, seeing um, how new people view these spaces first. So some things that we thought for future studies could be navigating the stacks specifically, like doing some studies around that. Um, what are the pain points for participants? Um, 
when they are in the stacks and their feelings of safety. And there was one comment on safety within the stacks of Widener and a patron's ability to know where they can get help sent to them if they are actually inside of the stacks. Uh, there was a comment in the chat about panic phones, and there are phones in um, the stacks of Widener, but I don't think a lot of people know that they can actually use those phones uh, based on the signage around them. And also another thing to note is if someone, for example, this gentleman was talking about like if he had a heart attack, how would he be able to tell someone um, that where he was if he didn't know where he was? And also how could he get service um, in the basement of Widener? So these are some things to think about a little bit more um, in future studies uh, and safety of the SACs and navigation there. And then communication flow was another thing that was noted specifically within the security guard interview. Uh, there was a note of communication breakdowns and changes of the space, um, which affect, affect frontline workers. Um, so we're suggesting research to further understand how this could affect wayfinding. And specifically with the security guard interview, they were referring to like if a room is closed or if um, there's like certain construction things going on. Um, it's hard for the security guards and also it seems to be from their uh, perspective, it's hard for the frontline workers to know exactly what's happening to in the space. Um, so thinking a bit about how we could study communication flow in the space um, for the frontline workers of Widener was a thing that was recommended um, by us. And then Question density versus expertise. Um, so something about maybe figuring out what are the questions that are being asked of staff members at the curricula, uh, curriculation desk or circulation desk um, to see if uh, there could be a need for a staff member at the circulation desk or elsewhere in the building or enhanced staff training of the frontline workers to help with these um, types of questions that folks get. Um, Thank you so much uh, for your time um, and I am open to questions.